easy to make a, an assertion without proof and documentation. Uh, Dan Brown in Da Vinci Code made a similar accusation that not just the Trinity, but the deity of Christ was invented at the Nicene Council. Never mind the whole host of church fathers that can be demonstrated to show otherwise. No matter what the scriptures themselves actually show, you can make all kinds of assertions, and it takes more than five seconds to try to give a response to these various assertions all over the map. I'll try to address a few of them, and I would invite you to investigate them for yourselves. One of the verses, or rather I was challenged to give one New Testament verse that Latter-day Saints do not believe. I would say Romans 4, verse 5, because Joseph Smith, in his inspired translation, turned it on its head and said that God justifies not the ungodly. And so it seems to me that there is a dichotomy. If there was a, uh, there was a misprinted Bible centuries ago called the Wicked Bible in which it said, Thou shalt commit adultery. It's one or the other. That's not something that is some shade of gray, some nuance. It is either God justifies the ungodly or God justifies not the ungodly. And I believe that all the textual evidence of the thousands of manuscripts is clear that God justifies the ungodly and that Smith even overlooks changing in the very next chapter. There are a host of things that can be read. I am not an expert on LDS history. I have a smattering of things I've picked up here and there. In terms of what information was available to Joseph Smith, there are some wonderful resources about the newspapers and what they were talking about in terms of the Indians, about uh, golden plates, I believe. I'm, I'm pulling this off the top of my head uh, because this isn't actually on our subject per se, but I think it was 1827. 26 or so, there was a report in the newspaper there in Ontario County that uh, someone had found golden plates. Um, there were also reports about the Mayan ruins that had been discovered that included temples and uh, all kinds of massive buildings and uh, a host of other information. I think that the standard has to be not what might prove it, but what is the totality of People claim Nostradamus predicted that uh, September 11th would happen. But where's the, where is the prediction beforehand? When you read Nostradamus, it's kind of like looking for pictures in clouds. It is not something that is a, uh, a clear prophecy like we see in Daniel saying, this is Greece, this is what's going to happen specifically. Uh, we have to also look at what people say that were there in the inner circle, Carly Pratt. He gave us a test. He said if the United States still existed within 30 or 40 years of 1838, it would be shown that the Book of Mormon and all the claims were false because they were expecting the judgment to take place. In terms of changes to English translations, I think there is a fundamental difference between something that was supposedly translated by the inspiration of God himself, not written only, but translated. Joseph Smith did not sit there looking at the plates. He took his seer stone, put it in his hat, according to his transcriptionist, and buried his head in, and it popped up word for word. The Bible did not come to us in English, despite the claims of the governor of Texas back in the 20s. He said, if... if if English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for the students of Texas. <laughs> Bible came to us in Hebrew and Greek, and you know what? It really hasn't changed. Now, there are some scholars who like to make a name for themselves by being radical. They like to say that they have an insight that no one has ever had before. And in terms of the Gospel of Thomas, I would uh, strenuously disagree that nearly universally scholars accept that it contains truth. Because I believe that when you actually study it, you find out it surrounded by some things that may sound remotely like the New Testament, you have a whole bunch of Gnostic garbage, just like in the Gospel of Judas. When the National Geographic Channel did a special on the Gnostic Gospel of Judas, they took the parts that actually sounded something credible, and they left out this huge portion 
about how the aeons beget the archangels, and the archangels beget the angels, and it's all this Gnostic stuff that we see all over the place, outside of Christian circles, and then being brought in by people who are trying to mix Christianity with the mystery religions and all the other things going on around them. The, English was, or the Bible was given to us in Greek and Hebrew. The English language has changed since the 14th century with Wycliffe. It has changed since Shakespeare. If you have any doubts, go watch a Shakespeare play and see how much you understand the first time through. There is also another factor that seems to get ignored. There's no one competing. I think Macmillan puts out a, an edition of the Book of Mormon. But I don't know of anyone competing to do a new translation of the Book of Mormon. But Zondervan, Tyndale, Baker, a whole host of publishers, Oxford, they are in competition to sell you Bibles. And so they come up with new, they come up with new translations because people have a hard time sometimes reading the King James. And so they come up with the NIV. They come up with the contemporary English version. They come up with all these other things. Is it because the text is changing? No. There are some people who try to radically change the underlying text, but the New Testament text, 97% of the roughly 6,000 manuscripts that we have are in complete agreement on everything except the most trivial issue. There are some questions that we have about what the text actually said originally in a few places. Like in uh, Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, it is necessary that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom they come. That's what half the manuscripts say. The other half say, woe to the man. Now, does that invalidate the inerrancy of Scripture that we don't know whether, you know, with 100% accuracy, that it is woe to that man or woe to the man? No, I don't think that that is any uh, thing that you have to stay up nights over. Protestant Bible, I think the allusion is to the Apocrypha. And I, I get so frustrated with people who don't read the history itself. Jerome, who translated the Vulgate, which was the official Roman Catholic Bible, in the 4th century, and became the Bible that had stayed with us until the Second Vatican Council, basically. Jerome included the Apocrypha, but he wrote specifically, this is not the Word of God. It's informative because it fills in that intertestamental period of hundreds of years of what happened between Malachi and the coming of Christ. But Jerome and others, uh, Origen, a whole host, no one gave legitimate consideration to it being on par with the Old Testament or New Testament, being inspired in any way, really, until the Council of Trent disregarded what Jerome had said and said because they found what they thought to be a proof text for purgatory, which is completely unscriptural and contrary to what we see elsewhere. But they went looking for a proof text for purgatory and they found something they could twist in the Apocrypha. So, Search it out for yourselves. I think that you will find that there are a host of issues. And in terms of chiasmus, when you read the Bible and try to reproduce something to sound like the Bible, whether the term chiasmus, whether the, the specific literary breakdown of it was understood prior to the 1850s or not, it's not a matter that's, that, I, that I grant. But I think that when someone reads the Bible, it's and tries to create something that sounds like it, it's not surprising that they bring over with them Hebrew idioms. In the same way that you'll find in non-biblical writings, reflections of the King James Bible, because it says, and he answered him saying, which is a literal translation out of the Greek, because it's two different verbs that are often used, and he answered him saying. Because that's a, an idiom in the Greek, it has been brought in through people reading the Bible into the English language. How much more when someone is trying to create another testament of Jesus Christ? And the, the issue is, what does the Bible say itself? The Jews were clear that there's one God. The church fathers were clear that the Father was not an exalted man. They keep shifting the ground and trying to say that, well, the Son is is an exalted man. The difference is the Son was God from all eternity. He became man and then got the, and then went back to the glory he had enjoyed before. 
It's a difference between taking um, sodium chloride together, without which you die, and taking sodium by itself, which will blow your head off, or pouring that will cook your lungs out. These things matter. It matters whether God justifies the ungodly or God justifies not the ungodly.
translator of the Vulgate, which becomes the official uh, Bible of the, of the Western Church, he includes it, but he specifically denounces it as it, he says it's informative. He says it's it's helpful in understanding context, but it is not the Word of God. You mentioned that there were you, you said that the uh, Gospel of Thomas did not have any genuine words of Christ that were not contained in the New Testament. Which respectable scholars were you talking about? Name, name one respectable scholar that says there are not new authentic words of Christ in the Gospel of Thomas. Which scholar would that be? Well, I think that F.F. F. Bruce probably uh, commented on it. P.D. Carson. Uh, they all thought there were authentic new words of Christ in there. I, I would want to be seen, I would want to be shown the uh, citations for that. I want to be shown the citations to say there were not. Okay, well, I can give you, I don't carry it around in my head. Uh, I, I'm not making excuses, but I get I'm through in the throes of a stomach virus tonight, so uh, oh, no. <laughs> my, my, my grip on things is a little more tenuous than normal. But uh, the, my question, my response would be, by what standard do they determine what are the words of Jesus other than their own opinions? There are things that were not recorded in the uh, Gospels that we do see appear, such as in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul quotes Jesus as saying it is more blessed to give than to receive, which I don't believe occurs in any of the four Gospels. There was sort of an oral tradition out there, but the I would not say that it is outside of bounds of possibility that something may have been out there in the oral tradition that was included, but I would say that it's completely bogus to say that we can uh, ascertain, like the Jesus Seminar does, taking uh, various colored uh, beans, or I forget the actual term for it, and they, they all pass a hat and basically put the uh, black beans in if they don't think that it's possible that Jesus actually said this. Red, uh, I think definitely, I forget the color scheme of it all. But by what standard do you say, I know this to be true? They're only basing it on their own subjective opinion. And the Jesus Seminar, I think we can demonstrate, has a host of biases against the canonical Gospels. They do not accept what the Bible says about these things, and they're looking for an excuse to throw them into question, and, and they get their picture, you know, they get they get covered every Easter trip practically in Newsweek because you know we're getting ready to remember the resurrection of our Lord, and up pops something on the Gospel of Thomas, something on the God of uh, the Gospel of Judas, up pops something that is this revisionist history. Uh, they were nuts back in, in ancient history, just like there's nuts today, and. By what standard do we say we know these things? Do you think Jesus was nuts when he said, as quoted in the uh, New Testament, there is no man good but God himself? The word anthropos does not occur in the Greek there. I'm not clear on how that appeared in, the, uh, in those English translations, but it's not in the Greek. I, well, I, I, I ran off on the, yeah, well, you can say it doesn't appear in the Greek, but the but, clear rendition of that is there is no man, person, I mean, no, no one talking about humanity, people, no, I mean, they're, I could, they're I not talking answer. about rocks, this, this is a question. If I can uh, answer the first part. Well, let me, let me see okay. if I can finish the, the question. There is no man good talking about humanity and then, but God himself. That is the clear meaning. You can, you can argue about the specific Greek words, but that is the clear meaning as expressed by the greatest translators of all time within Christianity. And this is Jesus talking. This is Christ talking. This is the words of Christ. I think there's a problem here in that the English language has changed and that things that you would say normally today uh, would actually be a great insult in uh, past centuries because the language has changed. I don't know the, you know, I don't carry all the stuff around in my head. I don't know how they incorporate the term man when it doesn't appear, when the word for man doesn't appear in the Greek. But what I can be, uh, be sure of is that they do not mean that God the Father is an exalted man because every one of the people listed there, the, uh, we have uh, John Wycliffe, we have uh, Tyndale, we have with the, the Great Bible and then the Geneva Bible. Um, you know, Geneva Bible, those are our guys. Uh, they all subscribe to 
Nicene Creed. They all are very clear. John Calvin, the inspiration of the, you know, the, the, the force behind the reading of the Bible. You read his works, and there is no place in there that you will find that the Father is an exalted man. They all subscribe to an extra biblical creed. Um, where in the Bible do you find the Trinitarian concept of homoousios, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are of one undivided substance? Which verse would have that concept in? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we have in John 1.1. 1, 1, <coughs> it's not the, there. Do you want John 1.1 1, 1 is clearly written, if you read the whole gospel, in the context of a Jewish understanding that there is one God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, in the first part, there is a differentiation between the Word and God. They are not completely identical, and yet, the Word is God. And we read in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, we find in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus did not think equality with God, uh, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. He emptied himself, though, and came in the form of a servant. Colossians chapter 1, I believe it is. In addition to leaving my Greek New Testament, I also left my English Bible. And my son's thing is a bit of a strain on 44-year-old eyes. Um, <laughs> Colossians 1, um, I believe it's in verse 18, but I can't see it. Um, no, it's a little, a little later. He says that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's too um, He tells two. Philip. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. In one, it makes a reference to that in him dwells all fullness. And then it expounds on it in chapter 2, that in him dwells all the fullness of God in bodily. Uh, we also have in the Gospel of John, uh, we have Philip say to Jesus, um, show us the Father, and that is sufficient for us. And he says, Philip, have you been with me so long and you do not know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So we have... A, in the context of what the Old Testament clearly says and what is reiterated by Jesus in the Gospel of John, there's one God. And yet, the Father is God, and the Son is God. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father. How does all that work? I'm a creature of dust and ashes who doesn't understand an eternal combustion engine fully, much less an infinite eternal God. You mentioned that the... <clears throat> current translation of the Bible, the hundreds of translations of the Bible are all in complete doctrinal agreement. You, do you see any... I did not say that. Okay, well maybe we could clarify. So there are many doctrinal differences between um, different versions of, of the New Testament. Uh, yeah, there are Gnostics today, just like there were Gnostics counterfeiting the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the uh, the Gospel of Peter and these other uh, works, Paul and Thecla, hold most of these Gnostic counterfeits that claim to be written by the apostles. Well, there are people who are counterfeiting translations of the Bible today. We have the New World Translation, which uh, abuses the text terribly and inserts words that are found nowhere in the Greek because if they're read in the con in, if they're read accurately, they're counter to the other position. And so the Advent has put out an edition. Uh, a translation of the Bible that added 168 words to Daniel 8 that appear in no Hebrew manuscript anywhere. Well, maybe you could tell us which translations are acceptable and which ones are not, and by what authority you come to that conclusion. I believe that there are a number of good translations. I, I don't uh, look to one as an inspired translation that some of the street preachers try to argue for that uh, the King James was divinely tra uh, translated and is without error. Um, it's an untenable position when you actually look at the changes in the three different editions of the King James. I think King James is a good translation based on good manuscripts. I think that the New King James is an updating of that language. I think the uh, New American Standard is a pretty good 
Bible. I have uh, differences with them in some of their selection of texts. Uh, the Pericope de Adultera, the end of John 7, beginning of John 8, where they believe, you know, they'll have footnotes in the NASB or in the NIV saying that the oldest and best manuscripts do not include this. I think that they are um, being very, very rash in their dismissal of these things when in the clear testimony of someone like Jerome, who had older manuscripts and, and much better manuscripts than they did, said that he found some that did not include it. It's the woman called adultery. Um, but he found many that did, and there was no question. It was a Catholicly, in the policy sense, a Catholicly accepted passage. And so, you know, I think that there are some that take, um, I, I don't like the uh, revised standard version. It's based on Westcott Court. Uh, I don't like the uh, Westcott Court text, uh, critical text of the, of the New Testament. Um, I, I think that there are good ones, like the NASB, uh, English Standard Version, I've heard some good things. I'm not that familiar with it, but it's based on the old, it's based on the NRSB, which is not all that good. So um, there are some good ones. There are some that are, um, I think, extremely, extremely speculative. Okay, we now have 15 minutes of questions from Pastor Wallace to Dr. Tanner. Uh, do you believe that the Bible is unclear on the subject of um, whether homosexuality is a sin. No, it's quite clear. And yet, there are many people who would argue that point. Um, there's a disagreement. Is that a, a lack of clarity in the text, or is that a lack of submission to the text? And you're asking me to speak for people who interpret the text in Catholicism and Protestant denominations and within the LDS faith. speak for them. But do you believe that it is reasonable to say, well, there are differences of opinion on this, and therefore the text is unclear and cannot be authoritative? Um, I, I see a very straightforward, although it has been watered down in some of the newer versions of the Bible, but I see a pretty straightforward statement by Paul condemning homosexuality and homosexual <coughs> There's just no question. Let's, let's shift gears. Uh, there are people who deny that the Bible teaches the deity of Christ. A slightly different question than what we were talking about. Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is not the Almighty God, He is a mighty God. Um, you believe that the scriptures are unclear that Jesus Christ is fully divine? No, I don't. The, the scriptures are unclear on that point. They say that Jesus is the divine Son of God the Father. And so, how is it that they don't understand that when it has been pointed out to the, at least the long time? How, how do you explain someone who has clearly been shown what the Bible says and then disregards it? How do you understand that? You know, I have that same question when I talk to people at Kingdom Halls before. I, 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 again, you're asking me to tell you why they believe as they do. I'm not sure I can do that. Um, I, I can belabor the point with the second amendment. I won't do that. Um, I won't push you for your political uh, affiliations there. But there are differences of opinion. Um, how would you respond to someone brothers here. How would you respond to Dan Lafferty believing that the that God had spoken to him in a still small voice telling him to kill his sister-in-law? To what authority would you point him to trying to contradict him? <laughs> One of the uh, major points I believe that God has expressed uh, it's, it's very clear in the Doctrine and Covenants you can find it in the Book of Mormon you can find it also in the Bible is that people are not commanded um, to do something that is outside of their stewardship. Uh, people are not commanded, uh, I have no control over your household. I should not be <coughs> telling you how to run your home. You should not be telling me how to run my home. And it is no one's right in this country that we live in uh, and within our system of laws and with, within our culture to uh, take the life of someone in our family. There 
history in the Old Testament where, according to God's law, you were required to stone a child or a wife. That is not part of our system today. There are other times uh, and places in, in the world within recent history where that's acceptable, but that is not our time, our history, and part of uh, the New Testament and part of the LDS faith. But if he responded with words of Peter, it's better to, to obey God than man, uh, what authority do you point him to to prove the point you just asserted? Within the Doctrine and Covenants, it tells us to uh, honor and obey appropriate laws. Okay, so um, you, you would appeal to a, to a text. I would appeal to Scripture. Uh, you, you mentioned deification. What church father ever taught that God the Father was an exalted man? There were uh, many who had that concept. Uh, there were many church fathers who said that we were going to come to the full stature of Christ and that Christ was going to have the full stature of God the Father. And so they didn't use the exact terminology. They the concept is in the New Testament with Peter, and it was expressed by... Um, by, by many of the church fathers that we would become like Christ if we followed him and Christ was like his father. So if by education. Alright, well tell me what the question is and I'll try to do a better job. You, you, it, it is true that uh, especially the Eastern fathers, uh, the Greek speaking fathers, uh, I believe influenced by Platonism, uh, had a very exalted view of what awaits Christians. Uh, in heaven, but what is blurred here is that uh, what church father ever taught that the father, that Elohim was an exalted man? You like Irenaeus, he had that concept, and you don't have to go any farther than <coughs> and the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Well, what, where, in, where in Irenaeus do you find and say that the Father is an exalted man. It does, he doesn't use that specific phrase in English, but he says we will be, for the fourth time, exalted like Christ, just as Christ will be exalted like the Father. That's what they say, and you can come to that conclusion. Hebrews chapter 1, let's try the New Testament. Perhaps that's a little easier for you to... Um, uh, to, to see, because many of the early church fathers quoted that. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, God, meaning the Father, has in these days spoken to us by his Son, who being in the express image of his Father's person. I mean, that's the truth we're going to get out of there. Christ is in the express image of his Father's person. The concept, the of the glory, but. That's right. The concept of person, according to any dictionary, any Christian dictionary or uh, secular dictionary, is the bodily appearance in human form, bodily uh, person. That's you, you, father's you, person. You, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, I, talks about the Father's person. I think it's apples and oranges, but I might move on to a different subject to you. You asserted that the idea of the Trinity was invented in Nicaea. How would you explain that uh, about 180, 190 AD, so well over 100 years prior to Nicaea, you have uh, Tertullian using the very term Trinitas that we, uh, that we use for the explanation of the relationship between the three persons that God had? I have no problem, Latter day Saint Stone, the Scripture Stone, with the concept of three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three, there's no question about that. The issue of homoousios, of one undivided substance, is not in the first chapter of John, and it is not according to all Protestant scholars in any verse in the New Testament. It is not there, and that's what was invented in the Nicene Creed in 325 AD. Would you 
consider James White a New Testament scholar? I have had a lot of discussions with James White, and I have uh, respect for James White. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> the, let's see, we were talking, or you made the uh, assertion that uh, it is necessary for us to work after uh, conversion. Isn't that the historic uh, Christian and Protestant understanding that uh, works necessarily flow from the conversion, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about instead of the LDS position that works precede. That um, really, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, by, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then the very next verse says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that he has ordained that we should walk therein. It's, it's, it's putting, it's like putting, wouldn't you see um, the difference between making a fruit tree alive and putting fruit on a dead apple tree? I mean, that doesn't make a tree alive. Well, I, I, I would disagree with the analogy, but um, the, the concept that after someone accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they will want to do good things, I totally agree with that. But we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, in the versions that don't have the deleted language that was unacceptable to Protestant faith, the concept that after people have accepted Christ, they will grow into salvation. It's a growing process. And I understand why some would, would want to believe that because it's an idea that runs rampant today that you're automatically saved and <coughs> instantaneously saved, but it is a process according to the Apostle Peter as he stated it in the New Testament, which I believe you what would be the authority? I want to squeeze one more in here. I think we're almost out of time. Um, what would be the only best view of Hebrews 10 where it describes that by one sacrifice, Jesus has forever, and it's used as an accomplished act, he has perfected forever those that are being sanctified. I mean, we make a distinction between justification and sanctification. And we believe that we are as justified when we've been brought to faith in Christ as we will ever be. There is sanctification that follows from that. Uh, there's also a, a acquittal of the last day. Uh, but that's a topic we can't squeeze in. But, no, I, but I mean, I, I, understand, I understand what you mean. But the, the LDS position, I think, is the one that Peter would express, and that is that no one is perfect. Repentance is required, and that's when we are able to take full advantage of uh, the gift, and it is a gift. It is nothing that we can do ourselves. There's no Latter-day Saint who believes they can, by themselves, get to heaven, work their way in, into heaven. It takes the grace of God to get to heaven. God's grace is absolutely required. But the very verses that we have from the New Testament on the middle chart here say that God will not extend that grace or that gift to those who are unrighteous, those who do not obey him. Those in the New Testament have already accepted him as their savior. Do I have time for one more? No. Uh, I, just as a lead into the question, I don't know of anyone who would question that the unrighteous will be saved, but where do you find anywhere in scripture that it is by a synergism of our righteousness with Christ, not wholly his righteousness? Because we have an Isaiah saying that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Um, you know, we we would agree that uh, being covetous, being a thief, uh, being an adulterer, being uh, a sodomite would be inconsistent with a changed heart. But Paul then goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you've been justified. Um, where do you find that there is any righteousness other than what the old theologians would call? A, an alien or forensic righteousness of Christ that is something outside of us. Maybe I can make this analogy. Tomorrow, if someone who had never attended a single class here at the University of Utah, never been enrolled, walked up to the dean's office and said, 
give me a diploma, they're not going to get one. If somebody who has gone all the way through all the classes that are required to get a diploma here goes to the dean's office and asks for one, they will be given one. They still cannot make a diploma themselves. It is something that is granted by a higher authority for doing the things required. It is still granted by a higher authority. It is not something a person can do on their own. And that's what God requires of us. He says, do what I ask. Be good after you accept me. Follow me. And that's why the statement was made by Paul to those in the New Testament that the unrighteous, he was talking to, the, to people who had accepted Christ. You have to follow what I've said. You have to keep the commandments. And if you stumble and fall, repent. And then the grace will be given to you. It will then be extended.
are many evangelical churches that no longer believe in the visible church. They don't believe in membership and accountability. They don't believe in a call of holiness or discipline. And unfortunately, the LDS Church, though from my perspective, I think that they have a uh, very small view of God in relation to what the Bible shows, that the LDS actually show greater reverence for an exalted man than many evangelicals show for the infinite, eternal, holy God of the Bible. There is an emphasis on family. There is an emphasis on the Sabbath. Unfortunately for many evangelicals, you mention the Sabbath and they just start hissing at you. Legalism. They talk about tithing, worshiping God with your resources. Honestly, if I was a Latter-day Saint, looking at things from a horizontal perspective, looking at this world, I would be hesitant to consider any of the claims of evangelicals. The problem is that even at its best times, the church has always been made up of sinners. I think that we may be about to go through a time of refinement in the American church. Because it may be illegal for us to talk about the things we've talked about tonight, for both of us. Though there are problems among many evangelical churches, there are also faithful churches. And you cannot simply look at other people's problems and kick up dust over there to avoid looking at your own issues. I believe that there are many vertical issues in terms of who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation. I think that Mormonism presents a different God and a different gospel. One that talks about being moral. In an immoral world, in an immoral world, that is a tempting thing. But the reality is, we cannot make ourselves moral. We can make ourselves Pharisees. We can try to establish our own righteousness and not submit to the righteousness of Christ. But what did Jesus say to the unbelieving Jews? They said, we have Abraham as our, as our father. He said, if Abraham were your father, you would believe me. And they go on and they say, we have one as our father, even God. He says, you are of your father the devil. There is a difference. The Pharisees were religious. They were moral. They read their Bibles. They said their prayers. They gave their tithes. They offered worship. But there was no change of heart. God has to bring that. What I call you to is to read the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word for it or anybody else's word. We had an atheist on our television program uh, last week and the week before. And basically, he justifies not looking at the claims of Christ because there are all these other religions out there that are, that are contrary. And if there's other interpretations and other claims, none of them can be true. It's a false conclusion. Just because there are counterfeits doesn't mean there's not a genuine. If you read the Bible for yourself, I believe you will find that God is not an exalted man, but he is glorious. Jesus humbled himself to become a man, suffer torture and abuse, take on the sins of his enemies, and lay down his life for those that hated him. That is radically different than a God helping good people save themselves by working really hard and grace being there when we've done all we can do when we deny ourselves of all ungodliness. The problem with legalism is that it says Jesus doesn't save you in your sins. You have to come out of your sins first. The lie of cheap grace is that God doesn't save you from your sins. He saves you in them, but he doesn't save you from them. The good news is that Jesus saves us in our sins, but he also saves us from them. And the reason Paul can say what he does in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, is because such were some of you. But you have been washed. But you have been sanctified. But you have been justified. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Do not trust in your own heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You can know it. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Read the Bible for yourself. Taste and see. Don't look for all the excuses. Well, there's, there's different people saying different things. There's different religions. There's this and that and the other. Read it for yourself and deal with Jesus Christ because he is either who he says he is as presented in the Gospels or he is a lunatic or he is a liar. I believe that when you study all these things for yourself, understanding that your life depends on the life of your children and your eternal condition, you will find that the Bible is not comparable to the LDS scriptures because they present a different God and different gospel. Amen. I have one I want to bring forth, but I haven't written it up yet.